Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, ONF and my new working group, um, which uh, its roots go back to around the last last year when we were uh, doing the Net Field Day uh, a year ago. Um, I'm going to go a little bit quickly. I am going to cover, it's kind of odd the way we got things structured with the, the other um, presentation on SDN coming afterwards. Um, there isn't a natural way to do it, but I will cover a little bit of what, what is also going to be uh, in, in the next presentation, but I'm going to do it in one slide. Um, so I want to give a, a little bit of background on the ONF for folks that might not already know that. Um, the initial goal of SDN, as I understand it, was really to drive um, experimentation and innovation in networking uh, at scale. So folks in academics were trying to use their network to try out new protocols, knowing that uh, we were going to run into, into barriers with the protocols uh, that we had uh, eventually, and that ultimately folks in, in the industry started feeling that pain and decided that this was an interesting thing. OpenFlow, the first spec was in 2008. Uh, and it was three years later that uh, the ONF was founded. Uh, why was that? Well, be they were, I think, expecting initially that uh, other <coughs> mainstream standards organizations would be um, taking, up the, uh, taking up the cause, uh, but they didn't uh, rise to the challenge. And so, you know, they were doing things, like the IETF was working on forces, and they've kind of been working on forces, that's forwarding and control element separation, for about 10 years, and not a whole lot has happened in terms of uh, shipping products. Uh, and SDN advocates kind of felt like uh, uh, maybe the, the certain vendors were impeding the progress of OpenFlow and SDN. Um, and so they decided to develop a, cons a customer centric um, organization, a standards body, and, and it's more than a standards body. <coughs> well, obviously, this is an ambitious move. Uh, they <laughs> Will the vendors follow? Um, you know, it's a new org, so it's got new dynamics and new processes. And you know, we try to adopt and steal from other organizations where we can, but we're we're still kind of uh, making it up as we go. Uh, and then, with our really broad goals, uh, it, it's a little harder for us to come to consensus. Um, and uh, creating an, an overarching architecture is a little bit more challenging when you're trying to to um, support so many different things. So here's the. The over the high level picture, you know, yeah, we got the historical view where all the intelligence was distributed in the boxes, and the new view, this is sort of the purest view that says, well, we're going to have an external controller, and uh, the, the boxes are going to kind of do what the external controller uh, tells them to do. Uh, a real picture would be for the future, at least for a long time, is going to be some hybrid of these two. Um, but in any case, I needed to show that, that the network controller is separate, and now we'll switch to a, a picture of a of an uh, OpenFlow enabled device. Um, and again, this is, uh, if you're familiar with this, it's kind of repetitive, but essentially every device, um, and this, this is kind of going back to the OpenFlow 1.0, I'll talk about uh, uh, one, uh, the, the next generation stuff a little bit too, because it's very important to my working group. Uh, every device has a flow table that's populated with a series of flow entries um, sequenced by priority, which is set by the controller. And as packets are received, these fields in these flow entries, there's matching fields that says, hey, does this packet uh, match this flow that's defined by the, uh, by the controller? And if it is, then qu quit searching and apply these actions. So it's a pretty, a pretty straightforward model, and it's, it's not too difficult to represent this model in uh, most existing hardware and certainly in, in soft devices uh, in the environment. So that's the picture again. Packets arrive, they're compared to the match fields, actions are assigned to them or applied to them, and uh, either, either it's forwarded or dropped or, or some manipulation is done. Uh, and here's more details on that uh, OpenFlow 1.0 picture. This shows more of the fields so we can match on uh, the input port or the MAC addresses, uh, source or destination MAC addresses, ether type, uh, IP address. Now in, in 1.0, IP address was only a V4 address. Um, now with later versions, we can do V6 as well. And then there was also uh, layer four uh, source and desk port numbers. Um, so then, yeah, in 1.1, which came out in uh, early last year in February, uh, they added this idea of multiple tables. Um, the, the single table model was fairly easy to implement, um, but it was um, not very expressive. There were, there were functions that you would like a box to do or a switch to do 
that uh, you were, you were hard-pressed to describe in a single table. So they added these additional tables, and they added, uh, in addition to other actions, they added a go-to action so that you could go at the end of a table, if you had a match, well, you'd go to another table and other things, uh, other actions could apply and so on. And, and uh, as a result, um, very rich, very flexible. Um, other things were added too, such as uh, some more V6 and uh, group tables, uh, which allow for multicast, uh, better handling of multicast and multipathing and, and things like that. Um, okay, so that's my high speed uh, background on OpenFlow and a little bit on, uh, on the ONF. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my working group, the, the Forwarding Abstractions Working Group, and what we're about. So as I mentioned, um, in March of 2011, uh, the ONF was formed. Brocade was uh, in on the ground floor. Uh, and in, in May, we, the ONF had its first um, group meeting with the members. And even at that time, I didn't fully get what they were talking about, but people were talking about um, some issues with OpenFlow 1.1. Uh, and when I looked in uh, very quickly after that, I looked in and I, I got to understanding what they were talking about. You know, this, this seems like it'd be hard to implement in my switch. Um, essentially, this multi-table pipeline is kind of both too flexible and not flexible enough. There are some features like learning, um, you know, Mac learning that are difficult to express uh, or currently impossible to express in the multi-table pipeline. Um, and at the same time, this multi-table pipeline is difficult to implement uh, on existing hardware boxes. Now, some people say, well, yeah, there's going to be more hardware coming along. It'll be open flow ready and et cetera. Maybe. Um, personally, I think the best way to get to future hardware is to ship current hardware and demonstrate that there is a market for it. If you can get out there and say, yep, it works and it de delivers stuff. For example, you know, you guys might have heard about the, the Google, uh, Google version of an open flow network that they've deployed using Google switches uh, you know, on, on uh, existing um, merchant silicon, but, but that's, that's more interesting, you know, to, to help drive forward um, new hardware. And we think that, that getting it deployed on our existing hardware is the best way to kind of clarify what that future hardware needs to do. So um, anyway, we were noticing this around, uh, you know, May and summer of last year. And then in October, uh, several folks over at Google, and of course, Google having done their own, um, their own internal open flow network, knew something about this. Um, they had already, they not only found a number of issues, but they'd uh, sort of put together a plan, more than sort of. They had done quite a bit of work to develop an OpenFlow 2.0 proposal, and they actually called it that. Uh, we've since sort of backed away from that, but that's what uh, some people still call it. And it was presented to the technical advisory group uh, at the ONF. And with the result that the next month, so this is right around the time I was presenting last year, and then the next month they created the future discussion group uh, because not, not a working group, so we weren't formally chartered or anything, but they said, yeah, why don't you go, instead of it just being a Google thing, why don't you work with the rest of the members and see if you can come to consensus on what all ought to be done. Uh, and uh, I was very excited about that and stepped forward along with, uh, uh, well, there was a guy at Google that stepped forward and, and Dave Meyer, who's my co-chair now on the, or vice chair on the uh, uh, forwarding abstractions group. So then in April, you know, we'd worked along for several months and come up with a clear plan. We sort of removed some ideas and said, no, all those are too futuristic and, and um, come up some vocabulary and so on. And we submitted a uh, charter for what we called forwarding plane models uh, in, in April. Well, that was the same time, if you guys are following OpenFlow, that was the same time the board said uh, 1.3 was just coming out. And the board had gave preliminary approval to 1.3, but they also said, you know, we just did this plug fest. It was all 1.0 equipment. 1.1 has been out there for over a year, and we don't even have enough beta equipment on 1.1 that we can do a plug fest with it. Everybody's doing 1.0. And meanwhile, we've got 1.2 and 1.3's, you know, right here on the cusp. Are we, or maybe we're going too fast. Maybe by changing things, changing the spec on a regular basis, you know, we're, we're causing a lockup on the, on the provider side. Everybody's waiting, you know, gee, if I introduce 1.1, I'm going to be late. Why would I, you know? So uh, they decided to pause. They said 1.3's got V6, it's got meters, it's got a bunch of other uh, important features. So let's hold steady on 1.3 for a while. And they haven't even formally said 1.4, when 1.4 is going to come out. Originally, they had said uh, it would be out end of summer. Uh, now it's, we'll see. You know, we'd like you guys, you, you providers, to focus on 1.3 for now. And I would say they're having some success with that. There's lots of conversations among people 
about the 1.3 stuff that they're going to do. So that was the context as we brought in this you know, sort of futuristic proposal for uh, what we called at that time the FP Mods Working Group. Well, the TAG looked at this, the technical advisory group, and gave us feedback and said, well, you know, we don't want you to be so futuristic. Can you, can you break this up into stages and focus first on making it easier to implement on existing hardware on ASICs and merchant silicon? So we revised it, our charter uh, into a phased approach and uh, came up with the forwarding abstractions working group. So our phase one is now focused not on FP mods, forwarding plane models, but instead on table typing patterns. So we, we were running out of nouns, you know, we were uh, searching around. So we came up with table typing patterns and we already had FP mods, which is kind of the next generation. And that's not approved yet, that's kind of out there and available. And so we came up with forwarding abstractions as an umbrella term for TTPs and FP mods. Uh, and we did that in about 30 seconds as we were going to press with our charter and we shipped it off and they said, okay, we like it. And so we were started and they said, we'd like you to be the chair in August. So that, let me talk about what, what was in our heads, you know, what was driving us for this forwarding <coughs> abstractions uh, working group. Well, first of all, as I mentioned, 1.0 was pretty simple. It was a, that nice single table, a series of entries. You could only match one entry. Uh, and, uh, and as a result of being simple, I think, it was fairly well adopted and you can solve real problems with it. Uh, basically, the, uh, the Google solution is essentially a modest extension of 1.0. But there is some complex forwarding. There are problems that you can't solve well with 1.0 and, and people saw that and so that was the pressure behind the creation of 1.1 and the, the uh, additional flexibility that is provided in 1.1. Unfortunately, there's two aspects of 1.1 and 1.2 and 1.3, but basically two aspects of multiple tables um, that are hard. And one is uh, this, this idea that we have to map the behavior into the hardware at runtime. Um, it's not just that these flow mods, which are the open flow messaging, uh, that's one of the message types, and so um, it's one of the more common ones. So we just say, oh yeah, when the flow mods come down, um, we have to handle them. They don't just communicate, in, in today's version of OpenFlow, they don't just communicate information about addresses and fields. They kind of tell you what the box is supposed to be doing as well. In a single table, an entry tells you everything you need to know. But in multiple tables, well, the whole behavior is a series of entries and you're not even sure how they tie together and you may get this table filled in and, and you don't even know what some future tables messages are going to be. So it's, it's still challenging. That's, that's one of the challenges and the fact that this is done at runtime. So the combination of runtime and incremental and the members of our group uh, sort of realize that, well, these, these requirements or aspects are actually sort of arbitrary and undesirable. We don't really need them and we don't really want them. We don't want them because essentially what it means is at runtime, the switch is trying to decide if it can handle what the controller is asking for. Well, nobody wants in a production network, nobody wants that uh, interoperability or, or is, is this thing, are these two guys going to play together? That shouldn't be resolved at runtime, right? That should be known well in advance. That should be a, a well understood question. If it's known well in advance, I mean well in advance like before you bought this stuff, weeks, months in advance, if you know it that far in advance, then why am I figuring it out again at runtime? If I've figured this out once before, why don't I just carry that wisdom forward and have my switch uh, know exactly what it's supposed to do? And then the controller can just say, oh, you know that thing we figured out before? You know that thing number 23? Because there could be many different things that you figured out before. Do that number 23 thing. Oh, gotcha, I know, how that, I know that number 23 thing. I'll do the number 23 thing. That was our idea. So essentially altering the framework. We don't really alter the, the message, I say don't really, We're, our plan is not to alter the messages at runtime. So those, at those flow mods, as they're called, that get sent from the controller down to the switch, unchanged. No difference. So a relatively non-disruptive model. Um, and instead, we share the, that pre-agreed picture of what the boxes need to do. We share that at the beginning of the connection. Both sides are clear and uh, off we go. And this, is, this has got nice side effects because um, once we've identified these switch behaviors that, that the two sides are gonna agree on, we can give them names and we can share them with our customers and with our vendors and partners. And so um, we have a model now where there's much better interoperability in OpenFlow. That wasn't really what we started out looking for, but it's a kind of a nice side benefit. 
Right now, there are so many optional features and capabilities in OpenFlow boxes, you really have to be an expert or the two sides have to, have to get together and do testing together before you can have confidence that when you get these two boxes and put them together, they might both be certified OpenFlow. But there are so many variables. Are they, are they going to work together? I'm not sure. Yeah? Curtis, that, so you're, you're overcoming the asynchronous problem. Right, so do you see that moving forward as staying in the management plane, or do you think that's going to roll into the spec as we get closer to 2.0? Uh, so... <laughs> and, and I'm using management plane, but I, you may not term it that way, but I see vendor differentiation early on in the management plane, and that's the, that's the special sauce until... So you raise a good point. Um, I mean, there's, we talk about separating, uh, and very quickly I sailed past it there in the early slides, about separating control and data plane. And then, okay, well, what's this management plane and how does that relate to control, right? Um, so what we've said is that, well, if it's, if it's rapidly changing its control and if it's slowly changing its management, and sometimes, depending on the application, something that might be uh, slowly changing in one application is rapidly changing in another application, like maybe tunnel setup. In some, set, some applications, tunnel setup is a control problem, and in other applications, tunnel setup is a management problem, just because of how we've drawn that line. So, with respect to what you're talking about, we've, we realize that these, these pre-identified switch behaviors are slow changing. And so they're going to fall under that management uh, category. And that was just a recent recognition. Originally, I had imagined we were going to change that in, in the open protocol, the wire, what we call the wire protocol. Uh, and then more recently, it's like, well, no, that really actually belongs in what's called the config protocol. And there is OF config 1.1 right now. And OF config 1.2 is under development. And, and it should land about the same time we're going to land. And meanwhile, I'm also coordinating with uh, the extensibility working group, which is already working on 1.4, even though they don't know when it's going to land. But we're all going to try and converge all this and have it land together. Otherwise, you, you may be offering v vendors and implementers a choice. Well, you can do this new thing from the forwarding abstractions group, or you could do the new thing from the extensibility work group. There's two separate things. We don't want that. So we want to make sure we provide a clear thing. But in answer to your question, um, the, the choice, the agreement that's negotiated between the controller and the switch about uh, complex switch behavior is going to be handled in the config uh, protocol. Um, and I don't even know if that's in my slide, because that's fairly new. Um, so let me see, did I, did I wrap up this other slide? Uh, anyway, what we are proposing is, the, is a new framework where we share information much more in advance. Um, we share information for implementers to use, and then the switch and the controller share information before they send down the, the flow entries. Uh, and as a result, they have a much more deterministic um, way of handling the flow entries. Plus, we get the benefits of understanding interoperability. We, the customers and, and other participants in the market, get this uh, information about what's going to be interoperable. So our goals. Uh, as suggested, are to really help adoption of uh, the, the newer multi-table complex open flow on hardware that is, say, ASIC and uh, uh, merchant silicon-based um, platforms. We're pushing uh, an idea called table type pattern. So those table type pattern is, is a, the name we came up with for um, the table-oriented uh, complex switch behaviors. Um, that, that we want the controller and the switch to agree on in advance. So we call those table type patterns. That was the alternative, uh, the, the, the new name. Uh, originally, we were, gonna, we were gonna depart from the table-based model with our FP mods concept, and uh, uh, we weren't gonna stick with tables. So now we're gonna stick with tables for the foreseeable future, and in some future point, we're, we're gonna loosen up and be able to support more than just tables, which will be good for you know, all the the uh, ambitious stuff to include connection-based um, networking and, and uh, other ideas. So in any case, um, table type patterns. Uh, it will ease controller side implementation because now uh, they can talk to multiple different boxes, all of which who have agreed on the same uh, table typing pattern. They, okay, yeah, we can all support table type pattern number 23. Uh, and so the controller sees uh, uniformity in its boxes um, and it provi provides this meaningful uh, testing, certification, and interoperability uh, picture, uh, as I mentioned before. 
So it's not just the, our working group that's going to generate these switch behaviors, these TTPs. We are going to ge generate the first few, which will be useful, and we expect them to be adopted in the industry. But we're, they're also going to serve as examples, and we're going to provide an instruction manual for how others can generate their own TTPs. Because last thing we want is for the standards body to be a barrier to innovation. So essentially, we're going to turn loose the uh, ONF community to produce other uh, complex switch behaviors, and then the market will decide. Um, so there'll probably be a little bit of a proliferation. Maybe they'll end up being 15 or 20 uh, in the near term before people agree that, no, no, it's really these four or these six that are the, the, the winning uh, behaviors, and there'll be a convergence toward a smaller number with probably a couple of oddballs uh, to fill in niche needs in the corners. Um, but the existing stuff will continue to be supported. So uh, in the event the boxes have a discussion about uh, uh, predefined switch behaviors, uh, TTPs, and they don't negotiate one, well, then you revert to uh, existing open flow. Um, and if you, if you have a simple um, switch behavior that, you're, that you need, like the one that Google did, well, a single table is good enough, and those are pretty, pretty deterministic, uh, and boxes support them. So, so there will be a, a situation where you can use these new TTPs, you can use uh, traditional, traditional open flow, um, and uh, there'll, be, there'll be a rich um, ecosystem to support your needs. Anything I leave off of there? No, and that was my last slide. So I actually went through that quickly on purpose to leave some time for the Q&A because that's where the fun is, right? <laughs> I have business cards in case we don't. Yes, them. Perfect. Well, just you know, in the community, there's a lot of you know at times confusion around where some of this stuff is going. So this is an awesome opportunity to clarify some things from your perspective. Um, but one big question that comes up a lot is how do we interact with the native existing network when you start? As Greg has said in the past, patches are brown, which is perfect. So you've got some kind of core. You start hanging off pockets or even you know half your, half of something you know, like slice something off into a VLAN on your existing, and that's your roadmap. But where that, where do BGP adjacencies and IGP adjacencies, where do you see that getting picked up uh, and basically redistributed into your controller to the native? So, so I guess you know, right, about the hybrid working group. There is a, a hybrid working group that's trying to sort out, I mean, this is a hybrid question. In a pure traditional network or a pure uh, open flow network, this is not so tricky. I mean, it's tricky enough. but. Um, then when you get hybrids, then it gets even more tricky. And they created the ships in the night model where the two, the two sides coexist, but they know nothing about each other, and then the integrated model. And uh, the ships in the night is also not so hard. Um, it's maybe hard to implement uh, for us providers, but the idea is because you promise to keep them separate, it's not so hard um, to build a network that way. But that's not what people want. Uh, and so we have uh, multiple hybrid models that are, that are essentially the other version, not ships in the night, is the integrated model. And they're, they're just, even today, even this week, they're, they're going round and round about how, how, do we, um, how do we do this in a standard way? Because there are so many knobs and variables in people's implementations that any, anything you propose seems to run into uh, uh, problems. Um, so um, my expectation is that, that it's, it's kind of separate and outside of what we're doing in the fabric. Uh, uh, forwarding abstractions um, working group, this, this, work, this challenge around hybrid. Um, I believe, Keith, uh, that they'll talk more about, like, there's something we call hybrid port mode that you'll learn a little bit more about. That, that is actually a really valuable tool in, in uh, doing some implementations while, you know, uh, while the ONF uh, bashes it out and figures out um, a more standardized way of doing that. And ultimately, what I expect is that there's going to end up you know, the other thing that's been talked about is that we don't have standard northbound APIs up to applications uh, from the controller side. And in the absence of that, it's sort of hard, well, how do you, you know, the controller should be talking BGP to somebody else, or the application should be talking BGP. Well, we're going to need to work on that as well. And so all those things are going on. There's also been created a, an architecture and framework working, uh, working group that's in its early days, but I, that's something that's been sorely lacking. And what they, they created there is uh, actually a design team. So it's, it's still sort of designed by committee, but it's a much more constrained committee. It's a seven person, and, and I know all the people involved, they're all very uh, solid senior people. So I'm, I'm uh, highly 
optimistic about what they'll come up with in terms of structuring it. Uh, and they're practical as well. So while, while the hybrid working group um, kind of stayed, <laughs> operated at a distance and was fairly abstract, and in the end, um, I think a lot of people, even the group itself, was a little disappointed with what they produced. I think the architecture and framework um, team is going to be more, uh, they're going to take the bit. You know, they're, they're, they recognize that this is an obstacle and that they have to deal with it. So that's, not, that's only an answer that we are wrestling and dealing. I mean that the lack of standardization is going to be an obstacle. Yeah, yeah. the hybrid for sure is, is going to be necessary. Um, and I think, you know, what you described about this sort of pure open flow thing, well, well, it'll be pure open flow, but only in the sense that this pure open flow thing is layered on top of yeah. traditional uh, transport layer. And I think there are slides that we have that talk about that in the next presentation. Um, not much of an answer to either one, but I'd be happy to talk more about those. <laughs> Well, the, the interesting, you know, there's how the MLX is, I think, is a, when I first read on Ivan's blog, yeah. what I learned about, you know, where you've got the same pipeline, you can carve out and then you teeter the other direction, then you have more open flow and less native, then you can flip, flip hardware, you know, focusing on the other. Uh, I think that's really unique and definitely differentiates. Yeah, and Pete will probably tell you more about that. Any other questions? Well, that was easy. Yeah. Um, I, just so you know, um, I was asked, so I'll be competing with you guys. Uh, I, I was asked to write a blog for the ONF about what my working group's doing, and I've been stalling. Um, but just recently, I've gotten enough clarity and enough vocabulary, because I'm dealing with these really abstract ideas, and yet trying to convey that to someone who isn't spending every day on one of these mailing lists. Um, and yet, at the same time, I don't want people on the mailing list to go, I can't believe what you said, you know? <laughs> Used, you said must instead of will in your blog. Yeah, that should have been a shall, yeah. <laughs> shall. All right, guys, <laughs> thanks. So I'll, your, I'll walk around with my cards. Oh. Can, can you give a, share your blog URL? Uh, it's not posted yet. Um, this is on the ONF blog. Oh, okay. So uh, it's a group blog, and then I think we will probably do something similar on the brocade blog, but I don't have my own. Uh, okay. My own. Yeah. One, one last question, if I can squeeze it in. Are you starting to see uh, some of the merchant boundaries starting to adjust? As much as you can talk about that. You know, uh, as a consumer, it's kind of an iron curtain, and you got, you know, the vendors are in the middle, and then we've got, you know, Intel, Broadcom, all that on the other side of the curtain. Yeah, they have curtains for us, too. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, but the thing that I notice is that they're all active. They're all in the working groups. Um, so Intel and Broadcom and Marvell are all active. And, and uh, I mean, I know them all on a first name basis. So um, I would say uh, I'd bet a dollar that they're, you know, they're definitely doing stuff. But what is it? Are they doing something incremental or are they doing something bold? I would guess that they're doing incremental because it's just such a big bet to do uh, a wholesale from scratch thing. You know, they've got opportunity costs, you know, it doesn't make sense. So that, to me, the, the stuff that I'm working on is, is very much an, aligned with an incremental kind of approach. If somebody's going to code up uh, the 1.3 switch model, well, then we don't need my working group. But I don't expect that to happen. And even if it does, we, it'll take us months to get that box out. <laughs> so. Yeah, software versus hardware. Hardware's real. You can't just, you know, you can't just say, oh, we'll, we'll just make the silicon look like this. Somebody hacks together a bit of code and then pushes it out the door. And it's done. Whereas silicon, you've got to design and test the design, then fab, go through, prove it out, and then you can ship it. You know, that's not... Long funnel. That's a long funnel. Well, it's so it's hard to implement emerging protocols and so on. Yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. when they're moving on a regular basis. Unless you've already created and you're controlling the working group so you can make sure that definition falls into what you sell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. You ship it, ship it, ship it first, then standardize it. Okay, maybe not. All right. Uh, thank you. And I'll